You know, uh, life in this world can be um, very hit and miss. We really don't know what tomorrow holds. You know, uh, we don't know uh, what may or may not happen tomorrow, uh, particularly with our health or, uh, you know, with our, with our finances or whatever may happen. You know, we're subject to the flesh and uh, the flesh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's got issues and problems as we get older and we know that. Um, but it's hit and miss what tomorrow comes for us. We really don't know some things. It's, they're outside of our control, a lot of these things. But in Christ, we, we're given certain guarantees. We're given s- certain sureties of the future and of what may happen in the future and what's coming in the future. And so we don't have to worry about too many of the tomorrows. We can be more focused on what's beyond that and, and the, the sureness that the Word of God gives us as we just go about doing the Lord's will. A couple of things we know of that we can be sure of in this world is death and taxes. We know all that. That's a pretty familiar saying. We're all going to have to pay tax and, 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 uh, and um, fall off the end of the planet one day. But um, uh, that's a surety. But um, God's, man, God's life is really just a, a vapor, the Bible says. It really doesn't last very long. And, um, and, and, and it's really not that significant either. We're going to have a couple, look at a couple of scriptures. Um, the first three scriptures, probably pretty depressing really when you think about them. And, um, but we're going, to, we're going to liven it up towards the end. But Psalm chapter 39, verse 5, I'll just read out a couple of, um, these are just single verses. You're welcome to turn there, but I'm sure they'll put them on the screen for you. It says, uh, Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age is as nothing before thee. Uh, verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity salar, or have a little think about that, it says. So he's saying, you know, um, before God, our age is really nothing. It's just a vapor, just a, it just lasts a second and it's, woof, that's it. We're done <laughs> in front of God's eyes, really. And um, in his time frame, it doesn't really last very long. And man at his best state is vanity. And uh, if you t- do a concordance search on that, it just means nothing, really nothing. Um, it means unsatisfactory and quite empty. Uh, really, nothing much in it in, in a man's life in how it goes. It's just, and, and that's our best state. That's the best we can do kind of thing. And um, so really, in God's eyes, none of that lasts very long. And our best state is really uh, just an un, unsatisfactory event, uh, really quite empty. You know, we're, we, we go running around. We're always running around. We're going somewhere and yet going nowhere sometimes, and, um, and, 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 and for what? We, we're hipping up position, p- possessions and riches and whatever it is uh, we think we're doing. Um, we can have a, we have a look at There's another verse in the next verse, Psalm 39, verse 6. It says, Surely every man walketh in a vain show. The word show means an illusion. Uh, we have an image of what life might be or should be, and we chase that dream. But the Bible says, but for what? But for what reason? Surely they are disquieted. Uh, That means we're not quiet. It actually means we're making a noise. Roaring about, raging about, trying to live this, what we think life is. We're running around doing this stuff. And uh, the Bible says we're doing it in vain, which is kind of just a big fat waste of time kind of thing because it's all over so quick. And before God, it doesn't really mount to much. Disquieted. Um, Surely they're disquieted in vain, empty for nothing again. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. So at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's all gone. When we go, the, the riches go to someone else and they'll probably spend it way faster than you ever will. And uh, that's just the way it is. And uh, all quite sad, really, but the Lord's, um, you know, it's kind of, it's all um, quite empty and doesn't last long in God's eyes. And uh, there's something far better to come, um, we, as we know. In Ecclesiastes, uh, this one's written by the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon. He penned this for us in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11 and 12. It says, I returned and saw under the sun uh, that the race is not to the swift, uh, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, uh, nor yet favour to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Just really just hit and miss, pot luck, be the right place at the right time and something, you might hit the jackpot uh, and, and everything will be right. 
You know, uh, I did. I read an article once about Bill Gates, right? Who was the wealthiest man in the world for many years, but he's really he, he was just he's really just a nerd in his garage, tinkling away on a computer. But if it wasn't the computer age, Bill Gates would still be a nerd in his garage and not the richest man in the world. But because of the way his brain worked and he, the age that he came into with computers coming in, it suited the way he was wired. Time and chance suited him beautifully and Microsoft Corporation started up and away you went and became the wealthiest man of the world for quite a long time. And so time and chance, it really was time and chance for him. If he was 30 years earlier, he would have missed that boat and, and, and so on. And, uh, and we see these things that it's, there's a lot of potluck involved in living our lives. It's time and chance happeneth to them all, as Solomon says. Verse 12, for man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men, men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. So we don't know, you know, what tomorrow holds, what the t how times will change. You know, we do live in interesting days. We live in, uh, there's, there's enough evil in the world and there's evil forces out there that would uh, destroy all we hold dear in life if we gave it half the chance. And, um, you know, we, it's a scary thing, uh, the world we live in today. And, um, you know, and time and chance could happen. We could, for all we know, we could be at war tomorrow. World War Three could start and that'll be it. Life will change for all of us. Um, the COVID pandemic taught us that lesson. Life changed very quickly. All of a sudden, there was no toilet paper, and that was the end of it, right? <laughs> all of a sudden, I just remember the treasurer going, it's okay, you can buy toilet paper. We've got six months supply. Two weeks later, he's on the television going, who's buying all the toilet paper? Someone at home's got a garage full of toilet paper. Bring it back to Woolworths. Anyway. Uh, nobody, is, nobody still knows what happened to that toilet paper today. It's a mystery, but this is it. Your world could change tomorrow for us, and, and all we hold dear could change very, very quickly. You know, uh, Jesus told us what the world would look like at the end of the age in Matthew 24 and in Luke, book of Luke, two great descriptions of it, and it reads like the six o'clock news. Um, and, and sadly, we're at that point. We're in the last days of the last days, probably, and... Uh, you know, it could all change very, very quickly. There are, there are evil forces at work and uh, um, sons of men could be snared in an evil time. Which, and a snare is a trap. If you know there's a snare, you're not going to hang around to get trapped. A snare means you're just caught and, and you can't escape. You're just caught in it and there's no, no and, it's, and it's sudden, it's quick. If you had a chance to get out, you probably would. But time and chance happens to everything. And uh, that's, that's our world. That's the world we live in. You know, how can we get... How can we find out what a sure thing is? How can we know in advance that we've got this life covered and we've got the next life covered? How can we know in advance all of these things? Um, how can we not make it a waste of time for mankind? How can we make our life not a waste of time but not, let, not be subject to just time and chance constantly and hit and miss and pot luck in life? And, um, well, the Bible does give us some answers. So we're going to have a look at some things now. In Matthew chapter 27... Uh, there's an interesting little few verses here and um, I want to make a couple of uh, similes here, comparisons and man makes preparations. Man prepares himself for a lot of stuff. They're preparing for war now and uh, we see a lot of stuff happening in the world and the war machines around the world are, uh, are really are gearing up at the moment and um, you know, and you know, who knows? Maybe war will break out. Maybe they'll it'll all turn to rust, and it won't break out. We just don't know. But we do know that man makes preparations, but they don't always work out. And um, and even man's best preparations aren't going to stand up against what God has already said will happen. So we've just got to run with what God says. And whatever man prepares against it uh, is a complete and utter waste of time. And we're going to have a look at that here in Matthew 27. Verse 62, it says, Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, they're talking about Jesus as being the deceiver, they really didn't like him, did they? While he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. So Jesus has been crucified now. He's, he died, and they've put him into the tomb. They're going to bury him. And these guys have come and go, 
oh no, the, he's going to, you know, he said he'll rise from the dead and we don't want that happening. So they go, they said in verse 64, they said, command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure unto the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. So they wanted to make sure that that, you know, they didn't want to make it even look like he'd risen from the dead just in case he really was dead and they took him to say, look, he rose from the dead. So they were really covering all their bases. They were making sure that Jesus was going to stay dead in the grave, which is sadly what a lot of religions do today. But this was their process here. And they said, let's make it sure. And they, they were going to the top of the ladder here. They came, went up to Pilate. So they're right at the top of the tree. This is the administrator of the, the governor of the whole country. And they're going over it. Come on, let's make it sure. The pilot said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So they got a big stone, sealed it over, set up a watch. They were making sure that body was not going anywhere. But of course, there's a lot of prophecy about Jesus rising from the dead in the Old Testament. God had already set the thing in motion. God's word's a sure thing. What man says, all his preparations aren't sure at all. Um, they're trying to make it sure, but it didn't work out for them. And uh, we know the story. Jesus rose from the dead. The angels came. The guys were blinded by the light. All this stuff took place. And, um, and Jesus was seen of several hundred people after he rose from the dead, just to prove it. And, um, you know, when what God had planned and what God um, was sorted out, took place regardless of man's preparations which is really probably the point i'm trying to make it happened while they watched right before their eyes in fact their actions were actually pretty good because their actions actually um, authenticated and established beyond doubt that jesus rose from the dead they actually set it up beautifully so that there wasn't any doubt which made it even easier for the disciples to go hey he rose from the dead we've seen him and um, they couldn't gainsay they couldn't talk against it because they had set a seal they were watching. They had made the, temp the, the thing sure. There was, there, there was no way that body could get out of there. But it wasn't there, was it? It rose. Jesus rose. So all the man's preparations didn't make any difference to what God had sorted out. So um, the, it had all been um, worked out from the very start. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. It tells us, Nevertheless, the foundation, that's uh, the substrate of a building, the very, the very base of it, um, of God stand as sure. In other words, solid, steadfast, completely stable. Having this seal or a stamp on it, the Lord knoweth them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So what God had set in place from the very start, from the very foundation, God had worked out things and he said, this is how it's going to happen. And it went ahead and, and it all happened. It stood sure. It was good and solid and and God had sealed it himself with his very word and um, made these things happen. But he's talking about now the Holy Spirit here in 2 Timothy. This is a letter to the churches here. And he's going, he knows that those are his. You know, it's a sure thing. You've been sealed by the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. So you've had a, a, been sealed by God yourself when you received the Holy Ghost that time. And God knows who he's given his spirit to. He knows who has it. And, uh, and, uh, but when man does the sealing and tries to seal up the tomb, it doesn't work out for mankind. But when God seals something, it's a sure thing. It's a done deal as far as God's concerned. He's done the sealing and it's solid and it's stable. When he's filled you with the Holy Spirit, he set you on a firm foundation, a substrata that will go on into the forevers, the Bible says in as some of our last verses today. It goes on into the forevers and it's absolutely sure. We're going to have a look at uh, Esther in chapter 8. And we're going to look at uh, a king had set a seal on something here. And a, a king's seal is supposed to uh, not be reversed, not to be undone. The king's word is the king's word, and that's the end of it. But we're going to go a little story here in Esther, just a couple of verses. And um, <clears throat> this was King uh, Ahasuerus, and he sealed and he made an order to... Um, uh, to um, preserve the Jews at the time. Uh, uh, Haman had decided that he wanted to exterminate all the Jews or those from the kingdom of Judah that were living in the land. He hated them. 
and uh, this guy wanted to have them all killed, but uh, Esther was uh, the queen, and uh, she went to the king and said, this guy's kind of conspired to kill uh, my people. She was from the tribe of Benjamin. She wasn't a Jew herself, but um, which, which is another Bible prophecy story, which we don't have time for today, but, but her Mordecai was from the tribe of Judah, and he came to Esther and he said, you know, you've got to talk to the king. This guy wants to kill all the Jews. He, they were going to go through the land and and uh, genocide the place um, and so anyway the queen had a word to the king and things got turned around and in the end uh, um, Haman got hanged on all the gallows and his family they all got destroyed because of it but uh, we'll take the story just up in verse 7 then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew behold I've given Esther the house of Haman and they have hanged him upon the gallows because he laid his hand upon the Jews Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written, um, written in the king's name, and seal with the king's ring, may no man reverse. So um, we see this is Jesus referred to as our king and our high priest. And when Jesus has sealed something, like you and I with the Holy Ghost, it can't be reversed. There's no reversing. There's no pulling it back again. Um, we can we can put that into damage ourselves, but we can't reverse that. It can't be reversed. When God's sealed you with the Spirit, He's done that, and uh, it's the King's seal upon something, uh, just like it was here in Esther's day, and uh, and it preserved those all those from the kingdom of Judah that were living in the land. It preserved all their lives. Um, when each seal was opened in the Book of Revelation, when the angels um, opened each seal and whatever was written in there in God's words in that seal that had to be done that each of those points in history took place um, and to man's best efforts and what he thought he was doing through history and whatever he thought he was doing whatever they thought they were doing through the dark ages and the Roman Empire and the kings and the queens and and all through Europe and whatever happened through 2,000 years of history well they were just opening seals and it's all in the book of Revelations for us. Most of it's mentioned of the story of the, the history of the world for the last 2,000 years. But God had already sealed it and, and had already put it there. Man might have thought he was doing his own thing, but he was just following what God had already set into place. He'd set a seal. So when each seal was opened in the book of Revelation, each thing took place as each angel opened each seal, and which, of course, it had to be done. It couldn't be undone. It can't be reversed. It had to take place just as each seal in the book of Revelation tells us. And we can marry those things up through history, through the time frames. Pastor Tim gave a great talk on that um, several, a couple of months ago. Um, Daniel in the lion's den, one verse here, uh, Daniel 6 verse 17. And a stone was brought. Uh, they, they wanted to kill him, of course. They wanted to put him in and uh, that wasn't God's will for him to die. They were going to put him into this uh, lion's den and they put a big stone across it um, and a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den and the king that's Darius at the time sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel so here we see another story a similar a bit of a simile to them sealing the tomb of Jesus and going up oh, oh, man's taken care of that one we've taken care of this guy rising from the dead it's not going to happen um, but of course it did happen <laughs> he rose from the dead because God had already said it God had already laid the foundation for those things to take place. God's word was sure, but man's word is not sure. What man does is not sure at all. It's not a sure thing at all. And and um, uh, Darius, you know, sealed it with his own ring and um, and with the Lord's, so it couldn't be reversed. And anyway, Darius really liked Daniel, and he went home and he couldn't eat. He was worried. He prayed for Daniel. The next day, he raced to where the lion's den was and he yelled out he goes Daniel are you there hoping for a voice to come back and Daniel goes oh king I'm still here and uh, he, he was wrapped and he said well pull him out your gods saved you and and anyway they threw all the guys in and their wives and their children in the lion's den that wanted to put Daniel in the lion's den so not a very good outcome for them and the lions had their way with them and that was the end of that but God had already had decided that despite what man's best efforts at sealing anything was God had another way and God's word stood at the end of the day and of course uh, Daniel was brought 
fourth and was well, uh, and the rest weren't. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So here we see another letter to the church, the people that already knew what being filled with the Holy Spirit was all about. And he's saying here, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You've got this seal upon you, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of glory. And the purchased possession is you and I, folks. We've been purchased with by Christ's blood and sacrifice at Calvary. We are the precious purchased possession. And we've been redeemed and we've been sealed by the Holy Ghost. That word um, is, it means acquisition, um, it means uh, preservation, and it means saving. And uh, we've been saved uh, by the Holy Spirit, by that wonderful seal that God puts upon us. In fact, that word is only in the Bible a Greek word for that purchased possession is only in the Bible five times, which is rather fitting because it's God's grace that made it all possible for us to be that purchased possession, to be redeemed, to be sealed by the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's only by God's grace that that can even take place in the first place. And that word is just in the Bible five times, just to give us a little backup to say what it, this is really all about. God's wonderful grace for us and he sealed us and his, his word is sure and we're in a wonderful place when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We have that, we have the more sure word of prophecy to look back on, you know, and um, I think that word sure is in there for um, sort of no good reason. It just seems to be a beautifully placed word. When we read that scripture, we have the more sure word of prophecy because it is sure, it's stable, it's solid. And when we read prophecy, we're not reading guesswork of the future. We're reading stuff that is going to come to pass. It's a sure thing that stuff is going to come to pass that still hasn't come to pass yet that we can read in the Bible, which is not much left, but that will come to pass just as sure as everything else has in the Word of God. It's a sure thing. In 2 Corinthians 1 and uh, verse 21 and 22, it says, Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us as God, who hath also sealed us and given us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So we see this again, that the Lord has sealed us and given us a wonderful sure thing only it can't be changed it can't be taken back but only we can um, we can change the outcome by our own actions we can go back to the world we can ignore it the you know, bible talks about people burying their talent and or you know or putting a bushel under the light and don't let anyone see don't let anyone see that you've been baptized don't let anyone see that you've been filled with the holy ghost we'll just hide that one uh, don't let anyone see the light kind of thing and um and talks about you know the as I said, burying the talent and nobody knows what you've got. Nobody's got any idea and uh, that's not a good place to be when it comes to the Lord. He's giving you something that's absolutely sure, that goes on for the forevers and the Lord wants us to share it. The gospel was designed once you know what it is and you've been filled with the Spirit. It's been designed to share. And uh, as I've said many times in talks, people often don't pick up the Bible, read it and go, oh yes, that's what I'm supposed to do. Yes, exactly. Oh, I, I must go find somewhere to get baptized by full immersion, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and I know I'll speak in tongues because yeah, I must go there. And um, you don't hear a lot of that, do you? You don't. <laughs> you just, you just, people get spoken to. People get it explained to them from someone else that's had the experience. And, and there was a gospel that was designed to be passed on and to given. And, um, and uh, we're in control of that. So God didn't make us puppets when he gave us the Holy Spirit. He says, well, now you've got it. Now you've got a sure thing. Let's see what you can do with it. Do something with it. And that's what the parable of the talents is all about. Do something with the talent you've been given and go out and talk to other people about it. So we're going to read um, this letter to the church, the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Um, and this is written to a bunch of spirit-filled people and it's telling them to um, live the new life they've been given in the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 22 that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, 
and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, uh, speaking every man truth with his neighbour, uh, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, to the use of edifying, that, may, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So he's explaining all these things that we don't go back to, that we, we get rid of this, we're on the new man now. This is the old man. This is perhaps the old man worked this way, but the new man in the Holy Spirit is different. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We see this word again being sealed and um, unto the day of redemption. And, and, and you're actually just, if, you, if you're just ignoring the Holy Spirit and, you, and you're living a life in the world and you're not living the life you're supposed to be in the Lord, you're really just grieving the Holy Ghost. And if you're grieving the Holy Ghost, you're grieving God and you're grieving Jesus because uh, they're all one in the same bucket. And um, you know, I don't think anybody wants to grieve God. And um, so don't grieve the Holy Ghost. You know, it's a done deal. What you have is a sure thing. And all we have to do to maintain it is to walk in the Spirit, to walk in the Lord. That's all we have to do and, um, and, to, and to maintain that. And, of course, to tell others and bring them in as well. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and glamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sakes, hath forgiven you. So just those few verses, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. But it just reminds us of the people we are now once we're filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, kind-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. That's easier said than done for some. You know, some people hold grudges and they hold them for years. And all it does is hold you back and you walk in the Lord. It it, it just stunts you. It doesn't do you any favors. It puts you put yourself in prison when you can't forgive someone. If you want to be out of prison, forgive. Forgive people. You know, some people don't even know that they've offended you or hurt you or said things they got no idea um and you just have to you have to learn to forgive and to move on and uh, and to know these are just lessons that they're teaching us the holy spirit's teaching us to live this life that we've been called to um in second peter 1 verse 10 just another verse here it says wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things, you shall never fall. And there's a whole list of things before that verse that lists very similar to what we've just read about, you know, being tender-hearted, being forgiving, being the type of person that God wants you to be now once you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, if you do this, if you make your diligent and your election sure, if you want to shore it up, just walk in the Spirit and you're already there. You're already three quarters, 90, 90% of the way there anyway. You might as well just follow through. And be the person that God would have you to be. Um, in Revelation 7, I've got three little verses. I'm not sure why I put them in here, but I'll read them out anyway. There's a reason the earth hasn't destroyed itself by now. <laughs> and I think this is the reason. We're waiting for the last person to get spirit filled. There's, there must be a set list. I don't know. Maybe there is. But we're still waiting for someone else to be born again. So uh, it's in Revelation 7 verse 1. It said, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So there was still a, somebody still to go. Maybe that was you or I. Maybe that's us. And, uh, and uh, maybe if you're, not, if you're out there and you're not spirit-filled yet, well, maybe you're holding up the whole process because <laughs> you haven't got baptized and spirit-filled yet. Maybe it's your fault. I don't know. But um, we know that we're still here and we've still got to get, bring people into the kingdom until the last one, until the last one's sealed. And then it's going to be over. And only the Lord knows the answer to that question, of course. We've got no idea. Um, Acts 13, uh, verse 33. 
And uh, Luke recorded these words and he tells us um, what, what a sure thing is here. And uh, we're just going to quickly go through this before we uh, finish the talk today. But in, ver- in Acts 13, it says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said, in this w- on this wise, I will give you the sure, that's trustworthy, true and sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And of course, we've got to understand that Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and the disciples and Paul, they were reading the Old Testament. That was their Bible. We've got their letters now. So we've got the New Testament of the Bible, but they were reading the Old Testament. So uh, there's a ton of quotes in the New Testament. They're really just Old Testament scriptures, but they're reading and going, ah, okay, I know what that means. I know what that means. Uh, Luke's going, "I, I know what the sure mercies of David are now. These are things that can't be moved. These are solid things. These are, these are God's words. These are, these are sure and trustworthy sayings. And he's talking about the sure mercies of David. And he's really talking about, which we'll have a look at in a moment, he's talking about this in um, uh, Covenant of Grace. But he figured out that, because that, um, David got a lot of grace from the Lord for the things that he'd made errors and he repented and he got a lot of grace from God. And, but he also got, uh, God made a covenant with him and gave him promises that were eternal, eternal promises and one forever promises, which is a pretty big promise, okay? Because, um, and, uh, and Luke read his Old Testament in Psalms and thought, oh, okay, I think I know what that means. So he quotes Jesus and he quotes the sure mercies of David. So he figured out that the mediator between the two was Christ was Jesus and he mediated these incredible sure mercies these promises given to David are now given to us and Christ was the mediator for that because through him we got the Holy Spirit and we were sealed through the Holy Ghost Christ was the mediator of the sure mercies when the Lord put his spirit into you and I and he made us partakers of the grace that was bestowed to us bestowed to us at Calvary Uh, this sure foundation was set up many centuries before uh, before God. He sealed it in his word when he made promises in a covenant to King David. And uh, the covenant of grace was an everlasting covenant. Um, and Christ was the mediator of that. And it was set up from the very start. And Luke was reading back at his Bible going, oh, these, these mercies, these sure mercies, they were, these were set up years ago. And of course, he had the mind of the spirit now, so he could look at these things and he had a spiritual set of eyes to look at the scriptures and all these, these verses must have just been bouncing out of the pages of the disciples when they were reading their Old Testament thinking, oh, wow, look at that. Whether they knew what it all meant beforehand, I don't know. Quite possibly not, because usually when we got the Holy Spirit, we get those spiritual set of eyes just to read it and go, oh, look at that. Look, that's what that means. And um, here he's putting us in the book of Acts for us to just say, Christ, the Lord raised up Jesus, but... We're just taking on the sure mercies of David here. We're just taking on this incredible covenant that's just never going to end. It's going to be unalterable. It's going to be immovable. It'll just be steadfast. It's this substrata. It's this foundation that's just been laid from the very start and uh, these sure mercies of David. In Isaiah, um, we'll read a couple of, just the last couple of verses in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. And um, this was uh, the prophecy of Jesus here. Verse 9, Isaiah 9, verse uh, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So these are all titles to Jesus. Of the increase of his government and peace... There shall be no end upon the throne of David. So they were piecing it together. In the book of Acts, Luke was piecing this all together. Probably was reading these very verses and this next verse I'm going to read from Isaiah 55. So he's they're getting, putting all these pieces together on, on how this is all going to work. And uh, of the increase of his government, peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice and with justice from henceforth even forever 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we see that this is going to take place and they're looking back at this and going, well, that's a prophecy of Jesus and that government, the throne of David, that one that started way, way back then is going to be established again and then there'll be no end to that one. Uh, and it's a done deal already. It's already a done deal and it's already going to happen. And doesn't matter what man's preparations are, God will make this stuff come to pass and it will happen. Just like they tried to make their preparations to seal Jesus in the tomb, didn't work because it was already stated that he was going to rise from the dead and he did. Uh, finish up in Isaiah 55. <clears throat> Um, so if you want a sure thing in your life, if you want to know, you want to have God in your life, get filled with the Holy Spirit, well, the Bible tells us here in Isaiah that it's absolutely free and um, just says, come and get it. It costs nothing. Absolutely costs nothing. So uh, Isaiah 55, verse 1 to 3. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy, uh, buy wine and milk without money and without price wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfieth not hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness it's just saying why do you why do you spend all this money and labor for all this stuff in a world of flesh like it's just but nothing but vanity according to what we read earlier in ecclesiastes and and it's just a you know uh, this is the only life we have of course and we make the best of it but in God's eyes it's, it's just a vapor and it doesn't last long and it's really a nothing event in the scope of what's coming the Bible talks about this life will barely come into our remembrance whether we remember it all or it's not worth remembering or we'll think oh yeah that happened back then oh yeah not worth it. that's it because the life you're in now a million years from now it's going to seem very insignificant very insufficient um, as that word meant, you know, vain meant, you know, it was insufficient. It just didn't cut it, you know, and uh, we're going to have this other life way, way, way into the future. He says, why do you do this stuff for stuff that's not going to satisfy, that's not going to work at the end of the day? Let yourself delight itself in fatness. Come to the Lord and um, come listen to what he has to say. It says in verse 3, incline your ear, come unto me here and your soul shall live. Um, that word here, they meet talking about open your ears, and do what you have to do to be saved, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come to God with a humble heart and let God do the rest. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And this is where it's mentioned here in Isaiah. The one Luke quoted, and he put the two together. He's going, well, we're, we're going for an everlasting covenant here. We're going for something that's going to last forever. And it's absolutely sure. It's solid it's going to happen. It's all going to happen. Incline your ear. Come. Really listen to what's on offer. The Bible's saying, if you really want to live. The deal is the covenant. And it's forever. It was an ever everlasting covenant made with David. And it was his sure mercies. It's a sure thing. It's sealed by the king. And it simply can't be undone. It's as simple as that. And it's the sure mercies. And if you want to be on a sure thing, come to the Lord and buy the stuff. But it's going to cost anything anyway. Amen.